Okay, we are in a brand new course. It's called Orchot Tzadikim, uh, The Ways of the Righteous. And you need to please si uh, subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up. Hit the notifications. That way I get paid. Okay, so we, need, we have 106 people that have signed up. We need only 890. No, no, no. 90. Uh, well, I'm sorry. It's eight, right, 894. I said 106. That's right. Oh, okay. Right. okay. So that's how many I need to now get paid. And I, how much hope I get paid? We'll never know until I get that big check. When I get that big check, I hold it up to you guys. Okay. Let's do, sign it up. Right. So now we are going to, like I said, Orchot Sudikim. Orchot Sudikim, we do not know who the author is. Okay? It's an anonymous author written approximately in the 1500s. That's what they want to say, the 15th century. If that's the 1500s? It was, I know it's from 1500. 1500, 16th century. Yeah. But they're saying the 1500s, so yeah, I'm 16th, not sure yeah, where, it, where it falls in that. 16th. Okay. So, uh, fine. And what it was written, they, they're guessing in Germany. There's really a tremendous uh, guesswork that's going on in this book as to the authorship and where it was written. But they're guessing, it's, it looks like to most people, that it was written uh, in Germany. That's uh, number one. Like I said, 1500s around there. And what he does is something that's quite unique. I assume it's a he. Okay, since it's anonymous, I'm assuming it's a he, but that could just be my prejudice kicking in. But it's uh, what is done by the author is to show us that every single character trait is important. And there's nothing that we should throw away. Most of the people say arrogance is no good. Okay, humility is tremendous. That's what everybody wants to say. Yet there are times that anger is good, that arrogance is important, and there are times that is detrimental. The same way as humility can be great, and at times it can be detrimental. Okay, so what he does okay, is he goes through all of these and shows you the positive and negative sides. And in the introduction, which is, like I said, for everything, you always should see the introduction, because from there you see what the author's design is and why the author's trying to get this across. Okay? Oh, unlike the other book that we read that had all these tremendous notes, I'm going to leave the notes for the most part to you, unless there's some note that I really enjoyed and I'll go through. Okay? But please don't skip them. When you're learning at home, read them. That's why they put them there, so you can get something more from them. Okay, like I said, if, if there's something you ask, if you ask questions on them, we can always look at them later on in the class, uh, in another time or another class, whatever the case is going to be. And I would, like I said, for all these classes, since you have the book in front of you, it would behoove you to read ahead of me. Okay, so that when I'm reading it, you already have your questions lined up, and then we can have the discussion. The discussion is what makes the book, not me reading it. Okay? So let's all try to make this interactive. And if I say something wrong, we have somebody who's read this book a thousand times and is going to come <laughs> at me. <laughs> okay, let's go with it. So now we, the beginning, page one. It says, the end of the matter, all having been heard, fear Hashem and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Okay? The fear of God, and again, we always have to uh, say, the fear of God does not mean I'm afraid of God. It means awe. In this case, it's always going to mean awe. When I have, because when I respect God, when I have that, so then I'm going to keep God's commandments because I realize they're for my best. Not because I'm afraid of Him punishing me. That's, that's not going to uh, work out. And so that's why it's the whole of man. That's from Kohelet. So this verse was stated by Shlomo Hamel, King Solomon, who was wiser than all men and who reigned over the upper and lower creations. And here he says, what does it mean? The upper, so Rashi says, that refers to the Shadim, the demons. So great was Solomon's wisdom that he had rulership over the Shadim. So fine. It's an interesting uh, concept. And then it says, uh, uh, and after he had all his, seen all his deeds and tested all the things. Again, you have to go back to the book of Kohelet, of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes. And taught much wisdom to the world. He sealed all of his words by saying, that the end of all things is fear of Hashem. Okay? Similarly, he began with Mishle, Proverbs, with the fear of Hashem is the beginning of knowledge, and concluded with a God-fearing woman, that's Eshech Chalmiyimsa, the last thing we sing every no uh, Friday night to our wives, 
And if, if you don't have a wife, you just sing because it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful proverb anyway. That's what we would say before saying Kiddush. So, and conclude with a God-fearing woman, she should be praised. Now, if another man, uh, can't skip pages here, had cautioned men to fear Hashem, his words would not be so readily accepted for them, by them, for they would say, because he had no other fears, and is idle, therefore he cautions to fear Hashem. Here, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, ran the world. He was the, the ruler of that whole, people were marrying into it. He had, what, 300 wives, because they all wanted to marry because he was so wise. He had people fawning over him. Yeah. And here's a guy who says, I tried everything, futility, futilities, all this futility, right? That's, that's what he's saying. He's had everything. He had money. He had girls. He, there's nothing he didn't have. And what happens is he's saying, with all that, the only thing that's important is fear of Hashem. When somebody of that ilk is saying that that's the bottom line, we have to have the fear of Hashem, the awe of Hashem, you could, he has clout. As opposed to a schlepper, <laughs> I don't know how to change a schlepper. But it's, it's opposed to some other guy who is not a winner and says, oh, you have to fear God. You have to have awe of God. Okay, have a good day. We're not really interested in listening to you. That's what the Orchot Tzadikin is, is starting out with. He's saying the person who said this had clout. Okay? And, but Shlomo Melech, who was wealthier than all men, as is written, and the king made silver in Yerushalayim as stones, and he was wiser than all as, and as king, as it is written, and he was wiser than all men. It is fitting for him to say, futility of futilities, futilities, all is futile. Okay? And that one should occupy himself only with the fear of Hashem. It's beautiful what he's saying. Okay? So that's the Orchot Sikin setting you up. Similarly, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, may peace be upon him, who was the chief of prophets, said, And now, O Israel, what does Hashem ask of you but to fear Hashem your God? Now, you have to think about this. For Moshe Rabbeinu, for Moshe, it was no big deal. You have to fear Hashem. <laughs> Having awe of Hashem is probably the hardest thing that we have. <clears throat> to be afraid of punishment is no big deal. But to have awe, to have the respect, that has to be worked on. It's like having love of God. That has to be worked on. Because we don't love Hashem the way we should love God. Think about it. We're supposed to give up our very souls, our very lives for God. How many people are willing to forfeit their life? People aren't willing to do a lot of things. Certainly not forfeit their life for God. But if I have the respect and I understand that everything that happens in my life is because Hashem says, that's best for me. And I accept it like that. With that, with that respect and love, oh, so I've done something. Yeah, that's a hard thing to ask for. Things happen in our lives. We're not exactly happy to everything that goes on, right? Something happens to you, and what's the first thing you say? Why did it have to happen to me? Well, that's a lack of love. It's a lack of respect. It's like when your kids say something to you, you're doing the best for them, you have to give them the medicine, and they saying, no, you hate me, you hate me, you hate me. <laughs> And you say, no, just the opposite. I love you. That's why you have to do this. That's why I have to hold you down so the doctor can give you a shot. Right? Uh, uh, I, I hit a funny one there. Okay. Yeah, because it takes more than one person to hold my child down. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and I sit there and laugh at him. Okay. You laugh at the, the, your, your son for his squirming. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. There you go. I'm a mean mom. So, so your mom, he's looking at you say, you get enjoyment from this mom. Okay. <laughs> Hey, that's how much you love me. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. But really, when you think about it, that's, and I always say this to people, we have to put ourselves in God's place. When we're complaining, we just reverse it. If we were, if we were in God's place, what, what would we want at that moment? Would we want to be complained to, or would we want to be appreciated for what we're about to do? When you need something. When you need something. Right, when you need something. When, whenever you feel like, why are you doing this to me? Reverse it, sit in God's chair, if you, if you will, and say, okay, what would, how would I like it if my child said this to me? Because we are God's children, mm -hmm. okay? We are God's children. And the same way we want the respect from our children, and the same way we want love from our children, so that's what we're asking for. That's what the Torah, the Moshe, and uh, Shlomo, and ultimately David was going to say. That's all you have to do. 
like I said, it's very difficult. Mm. We go through books about how to develop this. It's not a simple thing. Okay? Uh, but for these people, it was simple, and they're much the simplest thing in the world. Just have fear and love. It's beautiful. I know. What's your problem? <laughs> okay? And now he says, in David and Melech, King David made peace before him. Likewise said, the beginning of wisdom and fear is fear of Hashem. And because we view man as the choices of Hashem's creations in this world below, uh, being fashioned in his image of Hashem and in his form, and he is the nicest of creations, and he has a wise soul that delves into the secrets of what is above and below, this informs us that he is the end purpose of this world, and everything in this world was created for his sake. And it was for this reason that man was given a Torah of truth to teach the straight path, since man is uh, greatly beloved by Hashem, as we see that the angels serving the needs of the righteous man, as we find in Avram Avinu and with Isaac, and Yaakov says that the angel who has redeemed me from all evil bless the youths. And he's talking about his, grand, his grandchildren. And she says when, uh, that he's given that, that, that's a blessing, gives him that the angel that saved me should bless his grandchildren. And is written, and he struggled with an angel and prevailed. Again, you think of all what's going on here. You have people who are wrestling with God, wrestling with angels, wrestling with this. The angels are only here for us. We're higher than the angels. Why are we higher than the angels? Free will. Free will. That's what makes us higher. The angels have no free will because everything is clear to them. They know there's a God in the world. They have, they have to do what they have to do. So they don't get rewarded. They don't get punished. There's no, nothing there for them. They do it because they have to do it. On the other hand, we have free will. So since we have free will, we have to make a choice. Do we believe, first of all, do we believe there's a God? That's number one. We can always say, yeah, I believe, I believe, I believe. How do you demonstrate that belief? That's number one. Okay. But that's something that you have to think about. Do we do it? And then, do we really believe that God knows what we're doing? So people will point out the story of Genesis when God says to Adam, where are you? Oh, so God doesn't know everything. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. They'll use anything on like little kids. You know, peekaboo. You know, remember peekaboo when I was playing with the kids? Okay. So that's how we do like to do with God. You didn't really see me do it. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in my house. You don't see anything. No, you see everything. God sees everything. You can't hide anything from God. But we act as if we can, assuming we actually believe there's a God. And I don't care where you are in the, in the world of, it may be the 15th century or 2019. Uh, I have to always remember we're in 2019 now. Okay. But we all, and certainly in 2019, where people are constantly saying there is no God. You're dealing with atheists every single day. So it's, uh, those are the questions you have to keep in the forefront of what's going on. So once I realized there is a God, and he created this world for me, and the angels are only here for me, Everything is here for me. What does that make me feel like, by the way? Good or bad? Good. Fantastic. You created everything for me? Wow. Haughty. What? A, what? If you, if you could feel haughty, you could go haughty, and then what happens is you fall off the wagon because ah. God takes you down because now you're lower than the, uh, the ant. That's, we'll learn that too. But in, at this point, when I realize everything's created for me, well, one, I have a major responsibility. I have to earn my place. I have to keep my place. Because if everything's made for me and everything's working for me, you can take it away from me. Just as when we give our children something and they don't act properly, what do we do? Take it away. Take it away. And then they say, but, 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 but nothing. Act the way you should, and maybe, maybe we'll give it back. Is that what we say? Maybe you'll get it back. We don't guarantee it, because sometimes we forget. <laughs> You're supposed to get it back. So we don't want to be liars about it. So we say, do this and maybe. Maybe I'll think about giving it back. Oh, to say. Uh, well, welcome to God's world. Okay? Maybe I'll give it back to you if you act nice. Okay? So then what happens is, uh, and Daniel said, my God, my God has, uh, sent his angel and locked up the mouths of the lion. Again, he's thrown into the, the uh, he, at the bottom he says 23. This refers to the time that Daniel was thrown into the lion's pit and was saved. So Rabbi Sadia Gaon, 
explains that the lion that sits at the Kisya Kavo, the throne of Hashem in, in heaven, uh, instructed the lions in the pit to protect the safety of Daniel, called Daniel the lion. So da Daniel was the descendant of Yehuda, Judah, who was himself called, uh, named Gor Ari, a lion cub. Mm -hmm. So again, he sent, uh, God, may God send his angels and lock up the mouths of the lions, and they did not hurt me. And we further find, when we find further, that an angel came to the aid of the righteous, as is written, and it was in the night that the angel of Hashem went out forth and struck down the camp of Ashur. And you have many other instances like this. And it is well known that one man may be far superior to another, so much so that one person has the same value as many others combined, although they are of similar form and origin, one's, one's soul having risen to greater heights than the souls of the others. The first, allowing his wisdom to rule over his desires, and the second, the inferior, allowing his desires to rule over his wisdom. She says every time a, a person overcomes his Yitzhahara, his evil inclination, and places his wisdom before his desires, the level of sanctity of his soul is raised according to the degree of, of his efforts. There's a famous rule that according to the amount of effort we put in will uh, be the reward. Okay, so how much effort, I have to put a lot of effort in. The more, so by the way, for some people it's easy. Other people it's gonna be hard, right? It's like when you go to school, some people are geniuses and they never have to open up a book. Mm. They, they fold up the piece of paper cause they're, and then they bring it in the next day and they get A's. Other people are studying, oh my God, the amount of time they put into studying, and all they get is a C, okay? So, or, or worse, okay? And now what happens is, if, if the teacher is, I have two teachers here, so I'll be careful. If the teacher is a good, three, if the teacher is a good teacher, then the teacher recognizes <clears throat> the effort more than the work, and will reward the effort, because that's what we're supposed to reward. As, as, so the kid who's really a genius, doesn't do any effort, shouldn't get an A, but logically, unless that person puts effort in. So, but we can't give the kid an F because the parents will then come and say, what are you, crazy? <laughs> You're ruining my chances, my kid's chance to get into Yale? Okay, because of what? Because of your foolishness? Your 1970s uh, open class from Michigan that you have? Okay. But the truth is, again, though for those kids with geniuses, great. But you should give them something that makes them work. So they shouldn't be able to sit in the laurels. Everybody should have to work at their level. So it's the same thing with, with uh, spirituality. I have to be able to build myself up. So some people are lower on the scale, some people are higher. Again, for Moses, it was no big deal. For Solomon, it was no big deal. For you and me, it's a major deal. Sorry, it just is. The further, again, the further away we move, the further we see things going on, the further we have to deal with why good people die, blah, 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 all these questions that we have to deal with, the harder it is for us, especially, again, with the outside influences saying that we're crazy, the harder it is for us to, to live at that level. So now we have to work harder and harder and harder and harder. Again, even today, there are some people who would look and say, what's the big deal? What's the problem? Why, why are you having a problem with this? And other people say, what are you talking about? What am I having a problem? So again, for the, purpose, for the person who's saying, why are you having a problem? So there's not a test for him. So he has other tests. And the guy who has to work, he has his test. We're not judged, as the famous saying goes, I think Rav Zusha said it, uh, I won't be judged for why I wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu. I'll be judged for why I wasn't the best Rav Zusha I could have been. Mm -hmm. That's all. We're all judged individually. Hashem looks at us individually and says, here's what you should have looked at, here's what you should have looked like, and here's what you look like. Can you explain the difference? Mm. Think about that. Well, so it's all, I don't have to be better than you. I have to be, better, I have to be the best of me. Mm -hmm. That's what it was saying. Okay? And so, uh, and, okay, he walks all his days in darkness, groping as a blind man in the dark. Fine. So man has five senses. The first is the sense of hearing. The second is the sense of sight. The third, the sense of that of smell. The fourth, that of taste. The fifth, that of touch. That a man senses that he is feeling something. These five senses encompass all of man's acts. 
And no act can be performed without at least one of them. The heart acts through them in, these five, in, in that these five senses transmit all issues and actions to the heart, and thoughts follow after them. Now, we have to remember that the heart, as far as in, certainly in the rabbinic mind, if you will, is the seat of where everything starts. The, it's, that's where gonna, fights are going to be. When it, so in our, if you would update the language, it would probably be the brain, okay? But I don't want to take away from the, the, from the, uh, the writing, so we'll stay with heart. But again, it's the intelligence we're dealing with. I, I thought the heart was more like uh, towards emotions. Is that, that, that's that, is, that is the kidneys, I believe. Oh, the kidneys oh, are a seat of oh, emotions. Oh. If I remember, if I have to remember back to what the Gemara okay. is saying. Okay. But the, uh, it, this is where, I know that they like to do it because of the, the um, Valentine's Day. They like to have the guy throwing the... the uh, the yeah, arrow through right. the heart yeah. and making yeah. oh the lovey dovey, yeah. but uh, that's not where we're holding. The, I think I'm pretty sure the kidneys were the emotions, and uh, not the heart. The heart is more. You have to love Hashem with all your heart, soul, which was your brain, your your intelligence. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's what okay. it was. Okay. Uh, so he says uh, the heart is the center of many characteristics, such as pride and humility. Remembrance and forgetfulness, sorrow and joy. If you notice, it's going back and forth from one extreme to the other. Shame and arrogance and many others. And, all, and of all of these characteristics are strengthened by the five sent, uh, senses. For the blind man cannot act so haughty as if he were see, a seeing person. And he says, uh, okay. So he's explaining, by the way, that as a spring forward in 27, as a springboard for all that he is about to write, the author feels it is important to establish the origin and power source of man's character traits and the process by which those traits come to fruition. Once a person understands that his character did not happen by chance, but was developed by means of one or more of the five, his five senses, transmitting information to his heart from his thoughts, he can then try to monitor how, when, and where to use those senses. Blindness, for example, uses a tremendous... Uh, although a tremendous detriment to one, for one's ability to function, normally has a built-in advantage of lessening a person's potential for haughtiness. By contrast, someone who has eyesight is uh, whose eyesight is fine is much more susceptible to haughtiness. Because I can see, I, I can do everything. Okay. You know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say with heart, I don't know, I must have read something, that because anything that goes through your mind affects your heart. Heart speeds up, slows down. I mean can palpitate, and, and so I th may, maybe that's where they're understanding that from. Yeah. Or do they ever say anything? anything? Um, as a, I mean, um, the, the heart would be the emotion, seat of emotions? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of because of what we're, what we're seeing, hearing, feeling, and all the five senses, that will affect the way our heart is operating, ultimately. If you see something exciting, your heart starts beating faster. You know, if you uh, if you if right. in a relaxed so, situation. No, no. So I understand, this, but you're looking at. I mean, I'm see, we're, we're looking. We're look, tagging right, into, yeah. No, again, we're looking at it yeah. from 2019, where we know yeah. where we know all these things. Okay, so the rabbis and the Gemara. Yeah. Again, he's going from the Talmud. Yeah. yeah. So from the Gemara, they didn't look at it like that. They didn't. They weren't going to start looking at. If I'm afraid, my heart is going to stop beating faster. I mean, they, they were connected. They had some logical reason for, for saying that, though. Mm -hmm. for that, that all the senses go into the heart. Uh, you, be you're asking for a logic. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure there had to be a logic there. Again, because I'm, when it says, Hashem yeah. with all of your heart, yeah. so it doesn't, it, and we identify your heart as with your. Yetzahar and Yetzatov, where do we, uh, your good and evil inclinations, well, where would we put that today? And yeah, in, obviously in the brain, but I'm still saying that everything in the no, brain no, no. Does so, is, so, is affecting the heart. That's what it seems to me. And maybe, again, maybe that's because, why they're Because saying. we know that. Because we know that. Well, they must have seen some kind of going on with the heart, too. In, in Probably they're getting from verses. Out. They're getting from verses. You're going from the verses. Oh, so what's the ver then the verse is telling us that. The verse is uh, telling us that that's where the intelligence is coming from. That my Yitzhah and my Yitzhah Tov are there. Yeah. So 
that's the two inclinations. Well, saying, there's so many hidden things in the Torah that. No, I'm just saying. I'm saying again, yeah. the Torah is not contradicting what no, we know to no. be, but it's at the same time when we're looking at it, we have to understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. That the heart is really uh, going for the understanding, mm-hmm. and not not so much the pump. Today we know it's a pump, right? We 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 declared a pump. That's the. Our, our heart. We would declare it a pump, a simple pump yeah, well, and that, we, that reacts to this outside yeah, stimuli. Yeah. Okay, so the rabbi is saying, no, it's not true. Which, by the way, I mean, if you go back in, in the early Chuvot and the early responsa, when heart transplants were becoming the rage, ah, that yeah. was the big question. Can we do a heart transplant? Oh. <laughs> because if I change your heart, then I change you. Because you are your heart. Right? And by the way, again, update that. If I would take your brain and put it into your body, well, or take your brain and put it to your body, even better, okay? So now what happens? What? I would have to work out. Well, I don't know. Then he starts wearing a dress. I don't know. You know? <laughs> and imagine how, how, when you look through his eyes and say, whoa, <laughs> well, what happened here? But that's a real, you know, if you take the brain yeah. and you tra- trans it over, the person would be, this body is now holding your brain. You become a different person. So they, they were afraid. <laughs> they were afraid. What? Arya Kaplan writes about that. Oh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but that would be uh, the same thing with the heart. That's what they were thinking. That if I take yeah, okay. the heart and I put it into your body, so now you're no longer you. Physically, you're you. But you're no longer you because I gave you a heart. Now, obviously, thank God that we didn't stay with, th- that opinion didn't win, and people can get heart transplants if they, it's so necessary. And, they, they, and we know it doesn't change them, at least their memory. But we don't know, and we, and we have noticed it sometimes, that the person acts a little differently. Mm-hmm. There has been some evidence mm-hmm. that they, if they were, they can be either a little crueler or a little more compassionate, and that person who, uh, it was interesting yeah. that they've, they have seen some yeah, evidence of that. that. Like, I didn't like this food, but I like right. this food, and it was the right. person who donated their kidney or heart or something. Right, so it, it, the, it's, not, it's not so clear. <laughs> well, the Torah knows things. Right, so know. it's not so clear <laughs> that, you know, we're supposed to be changing uh, parts, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. But at the same time, yeah. you know, yeah. people... Yeah. We figured out how to do these things, it's, and so on and so forth. So, but there is that. I remember that uh, there was a, a response like that. That there was a question whether or not we can do it. Like I said, we we rule the other way. We we obviously do the heart transplant. But it's uh, but that's what I'm saying. When it comes to heart, remember it's the 15th century. Yeah. So they didn't they didn't have heart transplants, and uh, they were they weren't looking at that something like that. Okay. So uh, yeah. So therefore, that's where I was. Yeah, where are we? <laughs> okay, we're, I, I'm going to start the page, bottom of page 12. Uh, yeah. Therefore, last line. Therefore, every man of heart must strive with all of his strength to reach the ultimate that he can achieve of the higher qualities. And he must make use of his five senses and the many thoughts and traits only in that which will result in kindness and good deeds. Uh, and he explains, and good deeds, for every action there is a reaction. Man needs to anticipate what kind of reaction will result from his actions. In this case, we are instructed to see to it that we, uh, any use we make of our five senses will yield only kindness and good deeds. I said, for example, can be used for one's detriment, seeing, something, seeing someone else's belongings and desiring them. As the rabbis say, ha'ayin roa v'alev chomed, that the eye sees and the heart desires. On the other hand, that very same eyesight can be used to one's advantage, seeing someone else's needs and addressing those needs in a helpful manner. So I have two ways to use my eyesight, right? I can look at your beautiful, I don't know what you're driving, I'm guessing it's your truck, the truck this time? Van. Van, seeing your beautiful van and saying, oh, I like that van and I want that van so much, okay? And you know it's a Ford. You don't I don't want to Ford. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just ruined it. Okay. 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 But uh, you know, you know, I like Ford. That's the problem. Okay. But, so, but nonetheless, if I see something, 
I can use that. Or I can say, oh, he has a Ford. Guess what? I can put you in a better car. Yeah, that. he's in need. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but that's, that's what you're doing. Okay, so he says, so that if a man has attained a level of good, he should always desire to ascend to yet a higher level until he reaches the ultimate good, whereby he may, uh, he, he may attain the, re, uh, the reward, the world of reward, the world to come. And so I'm always, when it comes to spirituality, I'm supposed to always want to elevate myself. Now, what actually happens when it comes to spirituality that he has to say this? You know what happens? We're satisfied where we are. Most people are satisfied where they are. They say, I'm good enough. I'm good with God. God and I have a special relationship. <laughs> That's the excuse I usually hear. I think when things are comfortable. Comfortable. Whatever you want to call that. Comfortable. Very We're very comfortable. Like unlike, unlike with our material possessions. Oh. There we never have enough. We always want more. If I'm making, and I say this many times, the Gamora backs me up every time. If I, how much would you want Give me a price right now that you would be happy with. If you had this blank doll dollars, that would be all you need. Give me a number. Oh, goodness. I know that when you get there, you're like, eh, I need Come on, give me a number. Give me a number. A million dollars. The minute you get that million dollars, what would you say? I need another. I need a second. I need another. Right. I need... I, I, when I had... When I didn't have a... I always tell this uh, very nice story. I always like to give this uh, story. There was a guy who went to church and he heard this preacher and the preacher said to him, if you give 10% to, uh, to the, when the charity box comes around, give 10%, that's what you have to give and God will make you rich. Great. He hears that. The guy's making $50 a week. Okay, he hears that. He says, okay, $50. It's going to be hard. Five bucks. Okay. It's coming around. It's coming around. No problem. Here's $5. And he goes on. Every single week he's putting it in. $5. Good $5. Suddenly, somebody comes to him and says, Paul, I like, I like you. You're a good man. I want to give you, I want you to work for me. And you know what I'm going to do? Making 50 bucks, I'm going to give you 500 to change. The guy says, $500, no problem. He, he takes the job, great. Now what happens is Sunday comes along, and what happens, the plate's coming. And he knows the plate's coming. And he says, uh-oh, wait a second. Now I have to get 50 bucks. You know what I used to do with $50? I used to live with $50. How can I get fifty dollars? God, there must be some way I can get out of this. He's coming around, coming closer, 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 and he says, "Forget it." <laughs> Throws fifty dollars in. Okay. Every week he goes to the same stupidity. Then somebody says to another person, says, "Paul, you know, you're a nice guy. I see you're working for him really well. I have a job for you. I'm going to pay you, and I'm going to pay you five thousand dollars a week." The guy lights up. Five thousand. That's tremendous. Okay, gives his notice, goes to the other guy. Okay, he's working $5,000 a week. Now what happens, the plate comes along, and he's coming down. He's saying, $500. How am I going to get $500? If I could do it, I could get my wife a new thing. I, and so he's going through this. He's going through it. He's going through it. It's getting closer and closer and closer and closer. It's coming to him. He's at him. He can't do it. He can't put the $500 in. He lets her go. He goes to the priest afterwards. He says, Father, this is my story. I need a blessing. So he says to Paul, my blessing is you should make $50 a week. Because <laughs> then it wasn't a problem for you. Okay? When we make money, we want more. When we have possessions, we want more. When we have education, we want more. When it comes to spirituality, we have enough. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to grow. We'd say, we're good. I, I remember I used to be. I wasn't this good. I'm so great. God must love me. We stop. And what do you think about that? It changes how in general, like even just general life changes. Right. So a spiritual thing is a big change in your life. So it makes it, money is not, or material, it doesn't change so much you. I mean, I guess eventually it does, but... In general, it doesn't really. It's not that big of a deal if you make a little bit more money here, or you know, what I mean, like material. Again, if you, if it's not a big deal, but but a spiritual thing where you're making a commitment and you're changing something in yourself and your life is going to look differently. That's a much harder thing to do, even if you have no control over it. Like even just going into middle age, 
that kind of thing is extremely hard to do, even though you have no control over it. I hear what you're saying. I, I'm not buying what you're saying. Okay. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> I hear it. I I, so this is what I'm going to tell you, okay? Again, I'm going to, anything that mm. we want, okay, we we accomplish. We, we try to accomplish. And when we don't, we blame it on somebody else, by the way. Okay? I want to make a billion dollars. Why can't I make a million dollars? Because I didn't go to the right guru. Or I didn't make the right investment. Or this guy gave me the wrong, it's not, never my fault, by the way. That I didn't make my million dollars. It's always somebody else's fault, right? I'm never willing to take responsibility for that. When I make it, I take all the response. Then I take all the credit. And that's that's a simple thing too. But when it comes to spirituality, the difference between getting money, not getting money, getting success, not getting success, is I don't blame anybody. I just say I'm happy where I am. I don't even want to change. Unlike everything else, where I want to change. I'm happy where I am. I go to shul, uh, I'll uh, use us. Uh, I go to shul uh, three times a day, or I go to shul once a week, or I go to shul three times a year. I'm happy where I am. I don't need to change. And I don't find that so much. I, I get inspired and want to change, but then I let go. Oh, but if you, want, if you can get inspired, then what happens? Okay? Do, what do, I, do I work on it? Do I, yeah, and then I get overwhelmed. Oh, so. Oh, so, so that's you're like the exercise guy. Yeah, okay. It's very. I think the physical or physical and our spiritual are very tied together. No, no. I'm really sorry. I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing. When it comes to, when it comes to different. right when it comes to exercise, what happens? Everybody says I'm going to lose. Comes to January first, everybody says I'm going to go lose weight, right? So they all go to the gym. They they pay their money for the gym and they start doing the push-ups. What's the first thing that happens? By the way, the first day is really great because you can do like three, four push-ups, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> what happens after that? Oh, my, my body hurts, I can't, oh. just, I, I can't go to the gym today. The kids, blah, blah, blah. You're right, you fall off the wagon quickly. But what happens if you stay on the wagon, okay? You're gonna hit a plateau, right? There's always a point where you fall. You're gonna hit a plateau. You're gonna hit a plateau. Not necessarily gonna plateau, there's always that up and down. No, but normally you'll hit a plateau. In exercise, you'll normally hit a plateau, mm -hmm. okay? And it got to where, where even, even push-ups. Let's stay with push-ups. There's going to be a plateau you hit, right? Okay. So what happens? So you look at yourself and you say, oh, I'm happy with my plateau. Oh, look, I hit 50, hit 50 push-ups. I'm happy. Uh, um, whatever years, however old I am. Oh, 50 years, it's great. People aren't doing 50 push-ups, right? So you're happy at 50. Okay, that's, that's like spirituality, by the way. In other words, I never want to do exercise to begin with. But if I get to 50 and I, I, I feel good, so the, I'm through. Right? What's, what does a person need to do, though, if they really want to keep themselves in shape? Go for 51. Go for 51. You have to go past your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Because once you do, then you never know how far you're going to grow. How far you, there will be a plateau, no question. I mean, you know, you cannot, you're not going to become Moshe Rabbeinu with prophecy. But there's, a pla there's always going to be a plateau. But should I be happy there? Should I be striving to do more? The answer is yes. When it comes to... I don't think it's happy. I've learned that there's content. I'm content to be here and not go harder and push harder. I'm content. How's that different than happy? Oh, I think it's a big difference. Go ahead. I think content is just... I'm willing to learn. Go ahead. Well, no. I think if you're content... That means you settle into where you're at. When you're happy, that means you 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 enjoy where you're at. Content means you're settled with what you have. Even oh, okay. If you're not happy, okay. You're not. Okay. I hear. Yeah. I hear the difference. Okay. Good. Okay. People are content. Fine. I'll go with content instead of happiness. Good. And that's spirituality as well. Right. Okay. Okay, good. I, I hear, I hear. You want to say that they, they become lazy in their, in their ways. Okay, and they, as a result, they don't... I, hear, I can hear it both ways. I'm happy that I've reached that level and I don't have to go any further. So you want to say that's contentment. I think they can match up sometimes, yeah, right. but... Uh, You're resting on your laurels. Resting on your laurels, yeah. right. Yeah, right. I work with a lot of right. who are just like, I'm, I'm content. And I'm like, well, didn't you want to lose that? I'm fine. I'm <laughs> they weren't happy right. at all. They were discouraged and disappointed. Oh, oh so that's what that Sukhavi was asking. What I think you were also going there, right? If I go down? I was trying to, um, I guess, express the, the difference between the two examples you gave. Like one, it's very easy to change. It's much easier to change 
and be happy with getting more money or whatever it is, whereas on something that changes your life, whether you, whether you can control it or not, that's a very um, sort of stress-inducing. Oh, yeah, it's, no, and so right. It's not, so it takes a lot more force, a lot more energy to move forward in a spiritual way or in, a, in something that changes your whole life than in something that's outside of your body. You know? that, that's I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. So I'm going to say it like this, though. With both things, with money, exercise, spirituality, I think that the mistake that people make, and that's what he's trying to stop us from doing, is we, we have this tremendous goal and we go for it and we, don't, when we, uh, we push too much. We push beyond what we... We go above the level we should be going. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay? So in other words, if, again, if I start to... I remember when I was young, and I would start exercising. And my father was very much into push-ups, which is why I pick on push-ups all the time. The first time I worked out, uh, you know, after a while, I could easily push 30 push-ups. It wasn't a problem. The next day, my chest was uh, killing me. Yeah. And I would think, yeah, no, <laughs> not happening. I need some time off because the burn, and blah, blah, blah. And, and you, sit, you sit down and watch TV and while you're drinking your ginger ale or whatever you're drinking and uh, you have a good time and then three weeks later you think about it again. That would be uh, when you push too much as opposed to when I got older I learned how to do this. You start off with 10 and you build yourself up. You build yourself up. It's a constant thing and then when you're 3, 4, 10, 12 years later and where, when you were 13 <laughs> okay but you've built it up and now you can maintain it. Same thing with spirituality. When we jump into spirituality, when we jump into, I'm going to do, I make, uh, I'm going to do everything. You know, the Torah has 630 commandments. Well, darn it, this is the year. <laughs> I'm going for it. Moving to Eretz Israel. I'm, I'm going to buy some land. I'm going to be poor, rich, and everything else in between. I'm going to be the king and the queen. I'm doing everything. Not happening. As opposed to, as opposed to, I'm, going to try to do something here. I'm going to, and this was one rabbi, we read. The, I remember my wife read the story. There was a big rabbi who said he's going to read the grace after meals from his bencher, word for word, when he's at his house, on Shabbos, if nobody else is there. <laughs> By the way, why do we say that? Because we all know it by heart. Oh. So he would do it by heart. It was, and he said, no, I want to I wanna serve you better. There's a big rabbi talking. Not a, again, not a schlepper like me. A big rabbi. And he's saying, that's what he's going to do. When he's alone, on Shabbos, when he's not bothering anybody. And, and by the way, it only fits six months. That's what he said. Blineder. I'm not making a vow. <laughs> okay. He said all that. And that's a big guy. So why would we expect to jump more? Okay. That's what he was really trying to say. You have to go slow. And that you have to exercise it out. You have to keep doing it. The point, well, all that, we're, all that I'm bringing out is most people become content, become what you call it, rest in their laurels. I would say happy. Whatever the case is going to be. We think we've made it. And we don't strive anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's bothering us about. You have to keep striving. There's an element of time involved in this, but you know, the emotions like happiness and sadness right. are momentary. Mm -hmm. But the contentment, goodness, you know, the Derek Hashem, this is a life timeline. Right, right, right. That there's a difference between those that you might be happy like, you know, you get on to the Derek, you're happy that day, but can you stay on that for a lifetime? Correct, correct. But, but that's what I'm saying. That's why I think that I hear what you're saying, and you're right. When people try to go too far, too fast, they're going to crash and burn. Mm. If you go slow, then, not, then the odds of you crashing and burning decrease greatly. Doesn't mean you won't, by the way, because what also happens is there's a, there's a thing called life that uh, interferes with us 
and we you know we're on the top of the world and suddenly something happens mm. and pff, you have to start all over again and that's hard because you think again uh, using exercise you st if you don't do exercise you're a trainer you're still a, pr a personal trainer no sir no sir okay so but you you must have seen this with people right but yeah, my certification ran out, so okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't renew my certification. Okay, but the point is <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, but the point is that here, you have a person who will be with somebody, right? And then the person stops for a couple of weeks. And then they think, okay, I can do this again. Mm -hmm. And you want to jump back into it. She's going to tell you, don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. Okay. Go back work yourself up again because you lost what happens with us spiritually is we think we've made it then something happens we pull away that's something that made us pull away for that moment and then we think well we're right back where we were doesn't happen that's interesting drug addicts also say again drug addicts also so yeah, they, they get off mm -hmm. drugs and then they they have a weak time a weak point and they go back to it they go back to those pits that they used to be able to handle all right. Okay. Okay. There you go. And then you also have, and again, you, you see this. You see this from people. Uh, I won't pick on anybody because it, it's just a natural thing. When you're in Israel, when you go to Israel, okay, Israel is a spiritual place for Jews certainly, and I think for most people, it's just a spiritual place. But you have people who go and they get turned on. They get turned on, and they come back and they start davening, they start praying, and they take longer than the rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> That's how inspired they are. It's so beautiful to see. They're taking so long. They're saying the words. They're shockingly right. They're beautiful. Six months later, <laughs> Baruch Hashem lasted six months. But six months later, suddenly, they're not, the, the rabbi isn't going so slow anymore. <laughs> suddenly, we see that, oh, they're catching up to me. Okay. They came off their high. Why? Because they're not surrounded by their ambiance anymore. It was very hard to stay up there. So now, what it means is that we have to work really hard to keep ourselves there. And that takes a lot, a lot of effort. And are we willing to put that much effort into it? The normal answer is no, which is why we have these ebbs and, what was it, ebbs and uh, ups? Yeah, ebbs and flow. Ebbs and flow. Okay, that's yeah. why we have it. That's why, and they, they even call it biorhythms, right? Mm -hmm. We have those. We're, it's a natural thing. What we have to do is catch the wave. And then, like the stock market, if you ever watch the stock market, it's been going like this, up, but it keeps going up, 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 up. Hopefully, it won't crash, no. okay? But it's going up, and when it does crash, it does crash. But then it's going to go back up. It never stops, just, but it, it's going in a diagonal uh, that way. So that's how our spirituality has to be going, like that. And we should never, we should, we should always be worried, how can I improve myself that way? Again, he's going to give you, uh, we're running out of time, but he's going to really, uh, if we get off the Hagdam, which is going to take a lot more long, long than I thought it would, but it's, he's getting us to understand how to use our emotions to do that. We'll have to stop here, but that's what he's going to be doing. Hopefully we'll get there. And that's sort of what I was saying, that it's much harder to do. A hundred percent. If it would be easy, that's it. If you were right. we could all do it, I wouldn't be given the course.